During our research, the following newspaper article caught our eye. The Japanese steamer Shunsei Maru of 4,910 tons went ashore in the vicinity of Point Clotes on the northwest coast during the early hours of this morning. The Chofoku Maru announced that it was going to the Shunsei Maru's aid and should have reached her about 6 o'clock this morning. The Daily News, Perth, February 6th, 1931. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story of the two ships on the reef, the Trafoku Maru and Shunsei Maru? Here we are. Enjoy! The Shunsei Maru and the Trafoku Maru were both part of regular fleets of ships that traveled from Japan to Australia, picked up wheat in Australia, and then returned to Japan. The Shunsei Maru was a familiar ship to Australia, having started life in 1911 as the Baron Polwarth, before being sold in 1925 and renamed the Shunsei Maru. The Shunsei Maru had been traveling in ballast, headed to Fremantle, at the time she ran aground and it was generally agreed that that alone would be enough reason for her to go off course in such a location. The coast near Point Clotes had a reputation for shipwrecks, with shipmasters in Fremantle being asked their opinion about the Shunsei Maru having been wrecked, listing the many reasons why such a thing would happen. There were continuous reefs extending parallel with the coast for about a hundred miles, with an average distance offshore of between 3 to 5 miles. Visibility was often low due to smoke from brush fires. There was also a strong current that would bring ships close to shore, and the wind at the time the ship wrecked was heading west to southwest. With the Shunsei Maru unburdened as she was, it was all too easy for the shipmasters to imagine the light ship having been carried off course and into the dangerous reefs. It was true that the route generally taken by the Japanese grain vessels was from a direction that would have allowed them to see the Point Clotes lighthouse, but the air was described as hazy, and the wreck occurred at night. Considering the many ships people could list to have wrecked in the area, no one was likely to find fault with the crew of the Shunsei Maru. The Shunsei Maru sent out an SOS message shortly after midnight, reporting that they were aground the night of the 5th of February, 1931, but that there was no immediate danger. They added that the vessel was leaking badly and the crew was still on board. As the coastline was considered remote, they were most likely going to need assistance from the sea. The Chofoku Maru, which was also owned by a shipping company out of Kobe, Japan, received the message and replied that they were going to turn back and head to the stranded ship's aid. Unlike the Shunsei Maru, the 4,498-ton Chofoku Maru had already been to Fremantle and picked up a cargo of wheat. Since the Chofoku Maru was already on the return leg of her journey, she was about 100 miles north of the position of the Shunsei Maru, but she turned around immediately. Initially, the Chofoku Maru was uncertain of the exact position of the Shunsei Maru, and on seeing the stranded wreck of the SS Finn, an old whaling ship, they assumed that it was the Shunsei Maru. They anchored close to the Finn, but the wind was blowing strongly from the south and their anchors dragged. Soon, the Chofoku Maru was also in danger. The ship struck a reef with its stern and damaged one of its propeller blades. Realizing that they had been mistaken where the Shunsei Maru was, the Chofoku Maru headed north to join the other Japanese vessel, although now they were experiencing a vibration due to the damage to the ship's propeller. Meanwhile, the local aboriginal population had taken note of the wreck of the Shunsei Maru 
and a couple had run to the local whaling station about six miles from the wreck to get help for the people who had been shipwrecked. Only the nicknames of the couple were known by have been preserved, Long Tommy and his wife Mary Ann. On hearing about the wreck, the whaling station engineer, who was named Maurice MacBolt, gathered two of his workers and set out to see if he could help. They took a small launch out to the Shunsei Maru, but on stepping aboard the ship, they found that the crew of about 50 people were in a state of alarm. The Aborigines had been fishing turtles when they had come across the wrecked ship, and therefore were carrying fishing spears. The crew of the Shunsei Maru had seen a group of 20 people carrying spears on the shore, and had immediately decided that the shore was hostile and they could not leave the ship. MacBolt returned to the shore and reported the fears of the Japanese sailors to the fishermen, where it was apparently met with great amusement and laughter. Having explained the situation to the fishermen, MacBolt returned to the ship where he was able to convince the crew of the Shunsei Maru that they would be more comfortable on the shore at the whaling station, rather than on their ship which shook with every wave. The crew abandoned the ship, except for the captain, who insisted on remaining on board. When MacBolt returned to check on him, he found the captain in his cabin, and MacBolt reported that he seemed to be considering self-destruction, so he threw the captain's pistol overboard. Once this was done, the captain rejoined his men on shore, but they only stayed at the whaling station for a short time before returning to the Shunsei Maru. Once the Chofuku Maru was close to the Shunsei Maru, they once again dropped anchor. But this time, the anchor chain was caught on the reef and the cable broke. Attempting to drop a different anchor, they lost it, and the ship was left to drift onto the reef due to the continuing strong winds on February 8, 1931. The initial attempt to lower a lifeboat also resulted in the lifeboat being lost, though no sailors were lost in the process. With this, the men on the Chofoku Maru decided to wait, less than a mile from the Shunsei Maru. But, ironically, in a far more dangerous position than the ship they had come to rescue was in. Water began to fill the Chofoku Maru while they awaited orders from the ship's owners in Kobe. The first thing to go was the ship's dynamo at 11.30 the night of the wreck. This meant that they could no longer use their main wireless set. Instead, they were forced to use a small emergency set to send messages to the Shunsei Maru, who then relayed them to the outside world. By daybreak on the 9th, the messages from the Chofoku Maru said that the engine room and all of the holds were flooded. It began to look like a good idea to abandon the ship. They had advice from the SS Centaur who had stopped to offer assistance to the Shunsei Maru. He had told the captain of the Shunsei Maru where there was a break in the reef where the ship's boats could pass safely into calm water. The captain of the centaur would later comment to the papers that he was amazed at how close the Shunsei Maru had gotten to the shore. Meanwhile, Perth had sent wireless messages advising the crew of the Shunsei Maru where they could find fresh water and shelter, and had also been sent to help them. They were already familiar with one of the main places on the list, the whaling station that housed MacBolt. With the Chofuku Maru now in need of evacuation once again, Long Tommy and Marianne made the trip to the whaling station to let MacBolt know. MacBolt once again made the trip to the site of the wrecks, and this time went on board the Chofuku Maru instead of the Shunsei Maru. Here, he found a much more cheerful crew and captain who gladly followed him in boats as he guided them to safety, to shore, in what were, for him, familiar waters. Through all of this, several tugs had been standing by in Fremantle, in case a call came from the crews for assistance or to salvage the two ships. One of them, the Uko, was even scheduled to depart on the afternoon of the 8th, but was cancelled by the crews of the two steamers. They sent a wireless message back that they were now awaiting a salvage tug from Batavia, which had presumably been arranged by the owners in Kobe. 
the exact chronology and exact details for the removal of the Shunsei Maru's crew from the ship for the last time are unclear, mostly due to the spottiness of communication between the location of the wrecks and Perth and Fremantle. It seems as though at some point, another ship that was part of the Japanese grain fleet came to the site of the wreck, and after loading the crew of the Shunsei Maru, they returned to Japan. This just left the crew of the Chofoku Maru at the whaling station to try to find their own way home. Mac Bolt and the rest of the people at the whaling station did their best to be good hosts for the crew of the Chofoku Maru, but it was a heavy drain on their food supplies. The crew of the Chofoku Maru helped pad their supplies by fishing for clams which they ate, but Mac Bolt also decided to go back to the Chofoku Maru and try to salvage some more food as well as a small lathe he was told was still on board of the ship. He found that during the absence of the sailors, a fire of unknown origin had started in the ship's coal bunker. The Chafuku Maru was now listing to port, allowing the starboard side of the ship to smolder and burn. Macbolt still decided to brave boarding the ship and headed to the engine room where he had been told the lathe was. He was soon driven out by the rising water, though. The water had also entered the hold and soaked the cargo of wheat the Chafuku Maru was loaded with. This began a fermentation process which in turn produced so much gas that the decking of the ship and the timbers surrounding the hold began splitting and warping. Mac Bolt reported that when the Chofoku Maru actually sank beneath the waves, it released all of the gas that had built up and caused the entire area to develop an unpleasant smell. For two weeks, the sailors for the Jafoku Maru remained at the whaling station until immigration officials had finished their work, and the crew was allowed to travel to Fremantle, where they could catch a ship back to Japan. In the meantime, the Dutch salvage tug that had been dispatched from Batavia arrived and stood by. The tug, named the Kraus, had been dispatched specifically for the Shunsei Maru, which was just as well since between the fire and the fermenting wheat, the Chofuku Maru was now considered past salvage. Newspapers were also starting to voice doubts about whether or not the Shunsei Maru could be salvaged, but the Kraus would never even attempt it. After ten days of negotiations, a settlement for salvage could not be reached with the owners. And after refueling, the Kraus sailed for Java. On March 18th, a new person stepped forward to offer salvage work. This time, it was someone from Fremantle. Captain R. J. Sinclair, a marine surveyor, expressed his belief that the Shunsei Maru could be salvaged and set out to undertake it. He had better luck negotiating a contract for salvage than the Kraus had, since he agreed that he would not be paid unless he was successful. The initial survey of the damages to the Shunsei Maru was undertaken for Captain Sinclair by a familiar face. MacBolt wrote the captain a full report so he would know what to expect. When Captain Sinclair did arrive, he came with a work party which included a diver. The diver set to work underwater, replacing damaged rivets with bolts and filling damaged seams in the ship with hydraulic cement. The salvage crew would return on the 26th of May to Fremantle, having achieved what was being called one of the outstanding feats of salvage in Australia. Completely exhausted, and with a story to tell. The first step of the salvage efforts had been blasting a channel through the reef with dynamite. During this preparation phase, they were actually forced to add weight to the vessel with water due to the heavy swell in the area. Having gotten their channel made, they then attached seven anchors to the ship with cabling and began to draw the ship off of the rocks. On April 6th, they dumped 300 tons of coal from the holds of the Shunsei Maru overboard to lighten the ship, pumped all of the water out of her, and hauled her down off of the rocks. To everyone's relief, 
the ship immediately floated, though she still had a heavy list. She was able to travel under her own power through the dangerous channel and back into the open sea. With the task done, most of the salvage crew collapsed from exhaustion after days of grueling work. Most of the crew had not slept in three days. Enough of the crew was out of commission that the ship was no longer able to maintain a full head of steam, and the engine stopped after they had only traveled three miles. Captain Sinclair was alarmed to find that the ship he had just brought off of the rocks was now being carried by the wind and waves back towards the reefs. A hastily dropped anchor, the only one still on board the Shunse Maru, brought her to a stop only 300 yards away from where the Chofuku Maru had found her final resting place. The ship was brought under a slow steam, and with an abundance of caution, to Carnarvon, where some emergency repairs were performed to the ship's bottom while she was in deep water, and then she was brought to Surabaya, which was the closest port with a dock that could handle her size for repairs. Back Bolt served as the ship's engineer for her voyage to Surabaya. Once the ship was in Surabaya, it was handed back to the original crew, who had traveled from Japan to, once again, sail on board of her. On December 1st, 1931, it was reported that the Shunsei Maru docked in Geraldton, marking the start of the new wheat season. Less than a year after the accident that had nearly ended her career, she was back to once again take on a cargo of wheat to bring back to Japan. Macbolt was not forgotten. He received a letter from the captain of the Chofoku Maru thanking him for his kindness and hospitality. Included in the letter was also 50 pounds for, as the captain of the Chofoku Maru put it, services rendered. The Chofuku Maru was considered well past salvage, and when there was a call for purchase offered to the public, no one stepped up to accept the offer. The Chofuku Maru was left where she rested, eventually becoming a dive spot particularly known for a good view of her engines. The fact that she had gone to the rescue of another ship only to find herself to be the one past rescue would become her lasting legacy in the public mind. For more information, please see Chifuku Maru, 1931, and the Shunsei Maru by Michael McCarthy, or see other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.